This morning we are going to talk a little bit about mountains. We're living here in Exeter. We are blessed to get to see some pretty awesome mountains out to the east. This past week, in between the rain, you probably saw those a little bit. We had some clear days where you could take a look at those great mountains that we enjoy so much. When you think about those mountains, they're mighty. They're awe-inspiring. Some of those mountaintops stretch eight, 10,000 feet tall in the Sierra Nevadas. The tallest mountain of them all, Mount Whitney, is over 14,000 feet into the air. That's pretty mighty. But imagine taking that huge mountain and doubling it. Then you have the biggest mountain in the whole world, Mount Everest. Mount Everest is one of those mountains that tends to humble people. It tends to inspire all kinds of awe in them. I saw a special about it not too long ago, where some of the best climbers in the world were trying to go up this mountain, and some of them just couldn't do it. They had to turn back. Some of them got sick. They just couldn't take this huge mountain. Even if you are able to reach all the way to the top, you don't get to stay there very long. It's a short journey because the conditions are just too extreme. The temperatures are cold. There's a lack of oxygen. And if you make one false step as you trek up that mountain, you could plunge 5,000 feet off a drop-off. It's a dangerous, humbling place. It humbles. It has even killed some of the best climbers in the world. Today, we are going to go up a mighty mountain. A place that perhaps inspires a little bit of humility in all of us. Jesus is going to take us up a mountaintop in the Gospel of Matthew with his disciples. And as we talked about in the open today, up on this mountain, the disciples receive some pretty shocking revelations. They see things there, they witness things and experience things there that change their whole outlook on who Jesus is and what he's all about. This is one of those faith-shaping moments as the disciples kind of look back on it later on in their ministries. So today we're going to take a look at the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to take this trip with the disciples and discover exactly what it is that Christ is doing, what revelation he has for us this morning. So as we get into the text, we find the disciples going up the mountain, and then in verse 2, big things happen. All of a sudden, Jesus' entire appearance just changes somehow. We pick it up and it says, he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. The disciples get a glimpse this morning into the glory, majesty, and godliness of Jesus, right up there on the mountain. Everything about him is just shining at this moment. The Greek words used there in that text say that literally the light was just emanating through his clothing there. They see that Jesus is God. They see this incredible light show to show this. But what do we need to see out of this? What do we need to learn? See, here's where that shocking, faith-changing revelation comes in. See, not only is Jesus God, we can see that pretty clearly from the text, but Jesus is also the God, the only one. And to top it all off, he's not just the God, but he is the same God that you find and you discover on the pages of the Old Testament. That was a pretty shocking thing. You know, you might look at Jesus and say, okay, he's a godly figure, but now we see he's the only one. And we see it's the same thing going on in the Old Testament. And I love this story because it kind of helps bring the whole Bible together. You know, sometimes you kind of look at the Old Testament and you think, well, what's going on here? I don't really understand how any of this works. But here on the mountaintop, Jesus is kind of bringing it all together. He is revealing that he's the same God you find on the pages of the Old Testament. And if you didn't figure that out just by the big light show Jesus is giving us, then you figure it out in other ways as well. See, back in the Old Testament, God loved to reveal himself to people up on mountaintops. We probably remember the most famous of those when he goes up on a mountain with Moses and gives him the Ten Commandments. 
Well, here, Jesus is up on a mountain. And look, he looks like God. But wait, there's a little bit more to it than just that. A couple of Old Testament celebrities show up on the scene. There you've got Moses and Elijah right there with Jesus. Now, why are they there? See, in the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah were two individuals who also saw God in the same way. They also were, saw him reveal himself up on a mountain. So just in case the disciples, and just in case all of us aren't putting it all together yet, again, Jesus is showing that he is God. He is the Almighty and he's shown us that that same God from the Old Testament, spoken of thousands of years ago, is revealing himself again. But see, this time he's not revealing himself with smoke or fire or anything like that. Instead, God is now revealing himself in the true and living man, Jesus Christ. So again, what does that mean for us? After all, we didn't get to be there and witness all these things take place, but it still has significant meaning for us. See, if you want to know about God, if you wonder about having a relationship with Him, if you wonder who this Creator is, who is the Almighty, the divine God that we hear about so much, you find that information out, you find out who that is through His Son, Jesus Christ. <coughs> By going up on the mountaintop, Jesus pushes aside, casts aside certain ideas about faith and life that maybe sometimes we hold a little too dear. So Jesus takes us up on the mountain. He casts aside the idea that there is any other God. He says, what you see is what you get. But if we take a look closely, what we see is something incredible, something great. Jesus also does a little humbling of us here, too. Because maybe sometimes we like to kind of think, you know, we're a little bit of a big deal. We're kind of important people. Jesus shows us who's the most important. And maybe sometimes we tend to think, you know, I can have a relationship with God. I can have all of his promises based on me. I'm that good. Maybe we think, you know, through my efforts, through my accomplishments, through the way people look at me in this world... That is going to somehow impress God. Jesus takes a moment to humble us. He reminds us here on the mountaintop that he transcends, he is above all thoughts, all accomplishments, all religions, all ideas brought about by man. Now getting back into the text, the disciples kind of don't know what to make of this whole thing. We see Peter. Peter's always the one who's kind of the most outspoken of the disciples. And he's also the one who kind of likes to put his foot in, the mouth, in his mouth a lot of the time. Peter sees what's going on. He sees Jesus in his glory, Moses and Elijah showing up. So he just blurts out, hey, let's build some tents. Let's set up a camp here. You know, we'll, we'll build some tabernacles like we did in the Old Testament. And we'll make one for you, Jesus. And then let's put one for Moses and one for Elijah. And we'll just stay up here. Maybe forever. That, that's all right with me. This is pretty good. Well, I love what happens next in the story because God interrupts Peter right in the middle of his conversation. It says in the text, he was still speaking when God interrupts him. God interrupts Peter's ideas because they just weren't the best idea. And we see that a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Again, God puts a stamp of approval on Jesus. He says, this is my son. This is the one to listen to. This is the one you need above everything else. Now, how did the disciples react? How do you think you'd react if you were up there on this mountain with the rest of them? Might be kind of scary, right? Well, the disciples are terrified. They're, they're down on their knees here. You almost picture them saying, we're not worthy, we're not worthy. We don't belong in this place. They're frightened. 
And if we think about it, a lot of us would probably be frightened to be in their shoes as well. There's just something about God sometimes that when you think about his glory and you think about his power and his majesty, you know, it kind of puts you on edge. It makes you feel a little uncomfortable. The reason for that is sin. See, sin just comes along and it just messes up that relationship we could have with God. Changes our whole perspective upon it. Think about it in these terms. You ever been driving down the road and a police officer, you know, pulls up behind you and all of a sudden you, you kind of grip that wheel a little bit tighter and you watch the speedometer because you don't want to get a ticket. Or you're at work and all of a sudden the boss decides, hey, I'm going to kind of take a look at what you're working on. And you get kind of nervous because you're afraid you're going to mess up. Or when you're young, you know, you get a little bit nervous that maybe your parents are watching what you do. You know, they're keeping their eye on the report card and you get a little afraid that maybe they're going to find out that you did something wrong, right? Sometimes we take that same idea and apply it to God. Sometimes we're afraid maybe he's going to see we're not so perfect. We're not so good after all. Maybe we're afraid that, you know, the old stories you see in culture all the time about God are true. That he's just sort of looking down from heaven, waiting to zap somebody, waiting to get you when you do the wrong thing. That's how the disciples feel. They kind of have a first-hand taste of God's power and glory. And they're fearful. But just think about this story. Do you really think? That Jesus brought these three disciples up on a mountaintop just to remind them that they have sin. Do you really think he needed to take them all the way up this hill, go to this big show, just to remind them he's God and they're not? Something bigger is going on. Something's going to have to change so that the disciples don't have to be afraid. Something's also going to have to change in our lives so that we aren't afraid of God, but instead love Him and trust Him. The answer to these questions comes in verses 7 and 8. We read there, Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. So you picture this in your mind and you see Jesus, you know, coming to these disciples, they're cowering in fear. And maybe imagine him coming and, and putting his hand on their head or on their shoulder and saying, stand up, guys. You don't need to be afraid. You got nothing to fear. And I love what happens in the next part of the text. It says they lifted up their eyes and they saw no one but Jesus only. There's the answer. That's how these disciples here could stand and be in the presence of God. That's how they could even dare to be called his own people. They looked. They saw no one but Jesus. There was the answer. See, as we travel up this mountain today with Jesus and his disciples, we begin to understand why it is he came into the world. We begin to understand why it is that God would open up the heavens and send his son down here. It was not just to remind us that Jesus is the God. It was also so that God would restore a relationship between humanity and humanity and himself. See, when we look at Jesus, we begin to really understand how God works. We get another shocking revelation. When we look at Jesus, we understand, yes, God is filled with power and majesty, but we also understand that God is filled with mercy and grace. We begin to understand that God himself came down into the world to lift us up. Again, we see on this mountain, God is filled with mercy and grace. And he came down 
to lift us up. When we stop and reflect on that, when we stop and actually believe these promises, it's the best news we could ever hear. God is the one who came down for us. We like to think sometimes that God's sort of standing on the sidelines waiting for us to get our act together, waiting for us to kind of figure it all out. But the truth of the matter is that God came down and figured it all out for us. We see Jesus in all his glory so that God could perfectly picture for us that he is here. He has come with the answers. And people aren't getting zapped and they're not getting judged and they're not getting cast out of his presence. Instead, this God has come into the world and he's healing people. And he's forgiving sins and he's doing all these incredible things that deep down we hope God would do. But don't always, they're not always really sure that he really will do that. And then we see in Jesus, God has brought grace. He's come down to lift us up. And that's important to see in light of what Jesus says in verse 9. He and the disciples are coming down the mountain. And Jesus says, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. So what do we got here? Is it just kind of what happens on the mountain stays on the mountain? Not exactly. Jesus wants the disciples and he wants all of us to understand this in the proper context. See, this story really comes to life when we understand it in the light of Christ's resurrection. Think again about what's happening here. You see, Jesus in all of his glory, and you see Moses and Elijah standing next to him. Are they dead? No. They're alive. So we start to understand God's plan for us through Jesus. God's plan is that we don't just die and that's the end. God's plan is that we have life for all eternity. That begins to be brought to light up here on the mountain. In our epistle reading today, Peter reflects on that years later. In 2 Peter, he, he thinks back to the transfiguration, what happened on this mountain. And this is what he says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we came to you, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter tells us, guess what, folks? We saw God. He's the real thing. We saw him up there on the mountain, and we saw him raised from the dead. It's reality. And guess what? This real God has come to give you and me real life. That last part is so important for us to see. When we are talking about Jesus, we are talking about God actually coming into the world in real life, in real human history. But it wasn't just to put on a show. It wasn't to impress us with his power and glory. It was to give us life. Recall again in the story, Jesus comes to the disciples there. They're cowering in fear. They're trembling. They're worried. And he reaches out to them. He touches them. And he says, don't be afraid. Stand up. And maybe sometimes in our lives, we're afraid. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what worry, what problem is going to come to us next. Maybe sometimes we just worry that God is not going to reach out and touch us. And sometimes we are fearful that God is somehow angry with us and he's going to only bring bad things into our life. Then we take a look at Jesus on the mountain and we realize he still reaches out and touches us today. He does so through his word. He does so in this meal we are about to receive the Lord's Supper. Jesus again comes to us and he says, don't fear. Don't be afraid. And when we look up and all we see is Jesus, then all we see 
is that we have life. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the incredible news an incredible gift of your Son, who is God in the flesh, who is God in our world and in our lives. Lord, at times we are brought low by our fears and our worries, and we pray that you would lift us up, that you would enable us to stand and not be afraid, because all we see is your Son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.